Hello, this is Shonda Smith-Baker from the Minneapolis Foundation, where I am the Senior Vice President of Impact and the host of Conversations with Shonda. Today, I'm talking with Valerie Castell, who is sharing her story post Philando's murder in the most real and raw way um, that you can imagine a mother would. Um, I invite you into the conversation. Please be advised, this podcast does contain explicit language. So, you know, Miss Valerie, so, you know, first, I really appreciate you being here uh, with with me and, and sharing um, your thoughts um, and being so open and willing to give. Um, for our audience, would you share just a little bit about who you are? Um, I am Valerie Castillo. Uh, born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. Not East St. Louis. Let's not get it twisted. <laughs> St. Louis, Missouri. Philando was born there as well in 1983. But uh, I am Philando Castile's mother. And uh, I grieve for my son every single day. I adored him. I adored my son. And I would defend him in life and death. I founded the Philando Castile Relief Foundation right after he was murdered, and we help families who lose a loved one to gun violence, and we also pay off negative lunch balances within the Twin Cities, St. Paul and Minneapolis, and our hope and dream is that we can go outside of Minnesota and help struggling schools as well, to the point where Eventually, our government will uh, feed our children for free and supply free education as well. Our children have one job, and that's to go to school and be educated to run this country. And the least we can do is make sure that they're fed and educated properly. And that's who I am. Can you share with us who Philando was? Philando was the, the typical but atypical child, you know. Uh, he was different from the very beginning. My whole pregnancy was, was different. And um, the birth of him, it was different. Everything was different about him and his personality. He was typical but not so typical. He he was quiet, you know, and... Uh, I think back a lot on, uh, you know, us being together and him being in his room and having the door shut. He, he, he loved his privacy. And I would hear him talking to somebody in that room. I know I'm not crazy, but he would be talking to somebody and I'd knock on the door and come in and say, who was you talking to? Oh, nobody. <laughs> nobody. Yeah. Nobody. But his his spirit is so strong. I, I just believe that he had a personal relationship with God. And uh, I don't know if he knew what was going to happen to him or whatnot. But I tried to uh, teach him to keep his nose clean. You know, whatever you want. You know what I'm saying? Don't be foolish and go out here and do something stupid. Because what you don't want to do is end up in a penal system. Yeah. Because it's easy to get into, but it's hard as hell to get out of. Mm-hmm. And I told him, don't, you know, don't go down that road, you know, whatever you need, I got you. You know, you go and you get you a job and I meet you halfway. That was our relationship. We had a, a 50-50 type of relationship mm-hmm. when it came to uh, materialistic things. Mm-hmm. But our love was genuine 100%. He seemed like he had um, a real quiet strength about him. There's something about looking at his photos and then hearing how the kids at the school talk about him. Um, it, it made me think a lot about like the everyday heroes, the people that can be so invisible in so many ways. You think about black men and, and being in, invisible yeah. in society and, and being um, the victims of a lot of failed systems. And then you see African-American men that are so visible to our young people and the circles that they're in and creating hope and inspiration. And it's this very interesting kind of juxtaposition between the two. And um, he clearly kind of fit right right in there in the, in the most sad and tragic way, in the most inspirational way as well. 
you never really know how great a person is until they're no longer here. And then you hear people uh, coming out, speaking on them and, and letting you know how that individual touched their lives and what he did for them and how it, he made them feel. So, uh, Did you have any idea that he was making that much impact? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. But I can't say he he loved his community. I talk about this one. Uh, I still have his very first car, mm. the one that uh, he he prided. It was it's a '84 uh, Monte Carlo's T top, and he wanted that car so bad. I have never seen my son so emotional and ready to cry. He was ready to cry about that car. He's like, Mom, somebody gonna get it. You said you was gonna help me get it. I was like, Oh my God. You know, this kid about to cry about this car. I said, Lord, let me go get this car for this boy. <laughs> but, yeah, he he, he uh, had his, his own personality, and he loved this community. And he would take that car to somebody over on Selby to fix on it instead of taking it, you know, to an actual car shop or whatever. But he, he uh, frequented his community you know yeah. when he wanted something to eat he go over there and uh uh get food from Joycey you know he he said that her food was uh closest to mine I was like he did not have seen your food was better than mine that was a conversation <laughs> me in her head I was she was like yeah well Philando you know he come up in here all the time as he was still living then and she was like yeah he said my food uh just about good as yours. I say he didn't say it was better than mine, did he? She said no. But he loved his community, and I always speak on that. He 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 was about family, community, and those children. I think one of the 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 beauty of his life has allowed many people to see the humanity in the shooting, I guess, and the killing that we had um, made it so much about what did this person do right before. Yeah. And I don't hear that as much around uh, Philando's murder. I am struck though by the number of times I hear his name when I'm watching TV. Yeah. And the number of scenes that are recreated in a way that reflect some of what happened to him. Does that surprise you does that anger you does that um allow you to see kind of the legacy of his life or the difference he's making like how do you feel about that because i often think about you when i'm watching television i i i'm pleased i am i am pleased because that lets me know that he's still alive you know what I'm saying, you know? And he was done wrong on so many different levels. That's why you see him and hear his name so much because he was done wrong on so many levels. They tried to um, demoralize my son and uh, the way that uh, his funeral services was. Now, how many times do you see a Baptist minister in a Catholic church? You know what I'm saying? It's things that happen that have never happened before. You know, and people know that he was done wrong. You know, it's something that you, you if it's a way for you to bring that up and keep that going, then that I think that's what people are doing. They know how wrong it was. And they want other people to know how wrong it was, too, because he should never be forgotten. That was the worst thing that could ever be done to a human being. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You have nowhere to go. You strapped down in a car. You have nothing. You have nowhere to go. There is nothing you can do. So let's not let's not get it twisted, you know, and it just boggles my mind how you try to take this situation and say you was wrong. How, the, how am I wrong? I can't even do nothing. What can I do to you? You know, 
So I think people or uh, keep that 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 vision alive because they don't want you to forget how terrible it was. You need to understand how wrong it was. Mm -hmm. You need to know. You shouldn't forget because mm -hmm. that was wrong on so many different levels. I have four sons. And all I could see in the moment was a mother's worst nightmare happening. Yeah. And then you've got this mom and this baby in the backseat yeah. with just complete disregard for life. Yes. Um, and it played out so publicly. And I don't even have like remotely like any idea of what it's like to grieve out loud in the, in the most public way possible with a situation like that. And I see you as coming out with, you know, a, a anger, but a, a fair amount of grace, more than what I, I think I could muster up. I don't know. But, I mean, how did you, how, how have you survived this? Like, what have you had to do to survive this? I uh, have a lot of faith. I mean, I have religion, but I got a lot of faith. I base my life on my faith and uh, the spirits of my ancestors and the spirit of my son. You know, it's <clears throat> it's hard to describe because, you know, don't let the sweet taste fool me. You know what I'm <laughs> yeah. saying? I, I have come from a long past, you know, and uh, a good friend of mine, he, uh, told me, you know, he was like, you know, Val, you survived all of that because God was grooming you for the time when he, my son had came to, you know, his destiny was reached. When, when that pivotal point in my life, God had been grooming me, you know, going through different situations and being able to survive and, and knowing in the back of your head that you know, I was there, I was participating. I, I should be dead right now. You know, you think back on things that have happened in your past and you, you be like, damn, I, I, I should be dead right now, but I'm not, you know what I'm saying? So when my son was murdered, all of those feelings were coming and going. And when he pointed that out, you know, you have taken from me, you have, did my people wrong and I know what's going on and, and now this but one thing I'm not going to give you is my fucking tears that's what you're not going to get mm -hmm. every time you see me I'm going to be talking where you can hear every word that I say because you have to hear where I'm coming from and in between tears and sniffling you ain't going to get what I'm trying to give you mm -hmm. you know so yeah I I lie heavily on my faith in my God. Yeah. When I watched um, you and your daughter, especially your daughter, after that verdict, I mean, I remember, yeah. I like, I don't think I'll ever forget that in my entire life, right, of sitting in my in my former office, um, listening um, to your words. And I've appreciated that you haven't gone pol political that you just kind of give it to us raw, right? Like the emotions, you you don't allow for people to shy away from, from what happened. They shouldn't shy away from it because this is our reality and it's something that happened. It's a lot of people out here that just wish you just shut the fuck up. You know what I'm saying? Just, okay, it happened, now shut up. You know, just leave that right here. Now you ain't. You know what I'm saying? No, we're not going to leave it right there. Every time I can talk about my son, I'm going to talk about my son. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's my worst nightmare, that my son become a distant memory. You feel mm -hmm. me? Yeah. No. I want you to remember Philando DeVal Castile because he did nothing wrong, and he is dead. And this system said it was okay to murder a honest, loving, and caring human being. Yeah, I um. So after uh, his his murder, you got an outpouring of of support, and you got artwork sent to you, and 
people um, commemorating his his life um, in many ways. And I had an opportunity to see some of those works of art. Um, did that offer any healing for you in that moment? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it offered a lot of healing for the simple fact that each one of those pieces were made right then. You know, it uh, each piece had raw emotion and feelings embedded in it. So it kind of brought that healing comfort to me. You know, I would be feeling really low and bad and sad and I go in the room where all those pains was and things like that and it's like I'm surrounded by love, you know. So uh, God had uh, said that I needed to share it because every piece came from the community. Mm -hmm. that, that, that artwork was, was developed after a tragedy. This was the community's response. Instead of going and turning some shit up, which I'm sure they wanted to do, they found other avenues of uh, expressing that hurt and pain and sorrow mm -hmm. and grief. And, you know, I've always said uh, God knew what he was doing because he knew I couldn't handle all that hurt and grief on my own, so he shared it with the world. You mm -hmm. know, he he made everybody in the world feel my pain because he God knew I couldn't survive that amount of pain on my own. Mm -hmm. So he shared my pain with the world and they expressed it the way they saw fit. Mm -hmm. So you started the Philando Castell Foundation? Yeah. What, what moved you to um, start that? That's another way of uh, keeping my son's legacy alive. And uh, I wanted to continue to doing the things that he held near and dear to his heart. So I figured I may as well uh, start a foundation. And, and that way, hopefully, my prayer is that it'll continue when I'm not here. The Philando Castillo Relief Foundation will continue and it would thrive and be successful. So uh, that was just something that uh, my family and I had came together and spoke about and we made it happen. Mm -hmm. You did, yeah. you gave what, $8,600 a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week to Cooper High School. It was it was 8,000, but I'm, I'm, I'm you know, God has a way of uh, doing what needs to be done. You know, you, you don't have to do nothing. Just just follow his leadership. And everything you want and you ask for, you're going to get it. It might not be when you when you want it, but it's coming. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like last year, we, we gave out, like, Fifty fifty five thousand wow. dollars last year total, you know, and they 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 did have some uh, news on that and everything, but this eight thousand dollars went viral. <laughs> it did, and and I I I couldn't understand it because when I when we came to gift them, it was so many many news outlets there. I was looking out like. What is going on today? I'm coming to gift these good people, and all these news people are here. So I mean, I didn't know that um, it was a big deal, but it was a big deal. It was a big deal. Yes, it was. I um, my son's graduated from Cooper. Oh wow! And <laughs> um, I was sharing that. Uh, a group of their friends came over the house on the weekend to just talk to me about community and life and career. Yeah. And uh, they brought that up and talked about um, how their siblings that went to the school got their lunch bills yeah. um, taken care of. Yeah, I'm glad. I, you know, that's, that's... I don't know how I came up with, with the name, but it's Relief. Foundation. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that word relief in there. You know, 
I don't know how that came about, but I just fe- felt like it was fitting because everything we do, we try to bring some type of relief. Mm. We struggle so hard, sister. Yeah. We, we, we just got it bad. I mean, I don't care what you're doing or how much you think you get, got it going on. We struggling out here. And if there's any kind of way we can bring some relief, that's what we're aiming for, bringing mm-hmm. some relief into people's lives. Mm-hmm. Because it, you don't know what the next person is going through. A lot of us live paycheck to paycheck. And uh, some things um, we can do without, and that's worry. We do mm-hmm. enough of that mm-hmm. every day. We worry, especially when our boys leave the house. Oh man, we worry. It's gr- it's 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 gut wrenching. It is. It is. And mm-hmm. I always say that uh, people of color are the only nationality, race, whatever you want to call us that has to have the talk, Mm -hmm. you know. With our kids, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, back in the day, we used to talk to our kids a lot about uh, their life in general and uh, sex. Yeah. Sex was a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, the body is sacred, you know, and you know, you got to be careful out here when you running around sticking your thing, (laughs) you know, you have to be careful. And we used to talk to our kids about that. But now we talk about the interaction with the police. Yeah. See, the hard thing about Philando's situation, though, is that uh, the conversation has been about you're supposed to act right, tell the truth. Yeah. It's hard to explain that. It is. It is. It's hard to explain it. It 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 was um, disruptive in in a lot of ways. I think. I mean that. I think that's part of what you're feeling from everyone is this reality. You know, I had a a cousin who was murdered. He was going to be a police officer. And there was a a jealous ex-husband that followed him home and shot him twice in his back. They they never met. Wow. They never argued. It was was Minneapolis. 2011. In Plymouth. I mean, uh, was it? It was right. It was not far from um, where Jamar Clark was shot on Irving. Yeah. My my cousin Christopher Miller. Mm-hmm. I remember um, that. I remember yeah, that. it was my my first week of being CEO at Pillsbury United Communities, and and Chris and I were very close. But I think that was one of those moments where it's like, man, they can leave the house and someone can just shoot them in the back, right? Like I'm evolving in my own parenting around. It's not just people gang banging in the alley. Yeah. Right. There's all these ways and, and things. And, and that's a really hard reality to come up against that you can act right and still have these things happen. Yeah. You know, you've taken um, what has probably would cripple most. And you've been able to 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 move forward in a way that has included others in this story, both in your life um and and I just I just greatly admire it. Do you do you see yourself as a philanthropist? <laughs> Look, <laughs> I was gonna say I ain't know what the word meant, but I know what it mean. But no, no, no. absolutely not. No, I, no, I've never looked at myself as that. I'm a mother, a hundred percent, and you know, I wanted to give back to my community. Mm-hmm. And and keep Philando's legacy alive, and that's all I'm doing. I never looked at myself any differently in the way I move and the way I talk. You know what I'm saying, and how I interact with people. Mm-hmm. I never look at myself any differently, and I've never thought of myself as being a philanthropist. But I mean, if I fit the category, then that's what I am. But, well, I mean, you, you know, know, your son was such a giver, and yeah. and it feels like you were probably one of those community moms that just oh, like yeah. gave to everyone, Ooh, Lord, and yes. your last dollar would go to them if they yeah. needed it. And I think that in our communities, we don't often see ourselves as being in a philanthropist in the official sense, yeah. but we do understand that we're giving always yeah. as a mother, right? A mother gives a mother's love yeah. um, that gets infused beyond our own household and our own children. Yeah, I mean, I I I have always been. I don't want to say the go-to person, but if somebody had a problem, they'd always call me. You know, 
my head hurt and it's been hurting for two days. Oh, girl, you need to go to the hospital if you're taking your Tylenol and your ibuprofen and it's not working and you had that headache where all you're sweating, you know what I'm saying? Well, you maybe your blood pressure. You better take your ass to the hospital. <laughs> and uh, it's just that uh, I've always had that relationship with people and I give mm-hmm. and give, you know, and I've never thought anything different, but... I do want to keep my son's legacy alive. And he, you know, the, the apple don't fall far from the tree when, when it comes to uh, people. So, you know, my daughter is the same way. She gives a lot as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Last time I saw your daughter, she was about a, a couple weeks away from having a baby. And I see that beautiful baby now. Good. Uh, Philandra is everything. Yeah. Her name is Coriana Philandra Castile. We had to put Phil in there somewhere. Yeah. She wanted, you know, some of the baby name after the daddy because her first <laughs> name would have been Princess Philandra. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Don't play. <laughs> yeah, she's beautiful. She's everything. That kid there, she's smart. She's mm-hmm. smart too. She'll probably, she'll be walking soon. Not probably. She'll oh. be walking real yeah. soon. Yeah. But I just love her to pieces, and we have three again. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was uh, me and her and Philando, and it was just us. We were fine. You know, we didn't want for nothing because we, the three of us, we had each other's back. You know, if you you were slacking on something, I'm going to help you. You know what I'm saying? We just work together as a unit. You know, I mean, uh, that's the greatest gift in the world to be as a family and work as a unit of a family. You know, we, I try to keep that family value and bond together with my kids because so often by being a single parent or whatnot, uh, your kids lose sight on, on goals and aspirations and, uh, mothers, Single mothers have to come in and bridge that gap and continue to teach them the things that they need to know to be a productive citizen out here. Mm -hmm. I've always taught my children, you know, uh, all you got in this world is your good name and your credit. (laughs) You mess up one of them, you is screwed. (laughs) You screwed because, you know, you're not going to be able to get a decent job, decent housing, and you know, it, it it just has a snowball effect when you uh, don't have one of the two. You yeah. know, that's but. some good, some good old time advice there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So oh, yeah. S- speaking of advice, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you here is um, to get to get some insight and some groundedness because um, we have the Justine settlement. That happened recently, where um, that family received twenty million. Um, most of us in community recognize right away the difference of that settlement and the settlements that have happened to uh, many families that have experienced the same thing. And in that settlement, uh, they uh, gifted two million dollars of the twenty to the Minneapolis Foundation, and um, the distribution of that two million has fallen on my shoulders and I am of community. So I'm feeling all of the same things in real time. And now I have this responsibility of this $2 million. And I know that uh, money doesn't solve issues like this, but I know that it has a role in, in this work and I'm feeling conflicted and I want to just hear from you. (laughs) <laughs> um, so I know I'm coming in this conversation I don't know what's going to come back at me <laughs> I'm just going to say I don't know <laughs> we did not talk about this and um, I I just I can't imagine the amount of, of pain and, and, and disappointment and anger that would um, be a consequence of, of such a decision but I just I mean that's what I'm that's what I'm sitting on Miss Valerie yeah. yeah that is a, a big responsibility as a whole and like you said money is not going to solve uh any of our legitimate issues you know it's not even a band-aid you know because two million dollars in essence uh with all the things that we have going on with 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 our 
uh, communities. You know, $2 million is not a, a, a whole lot, but what you want to do is be more than the, the justice system. You know, the justice system says they are supposed to be just, fair, and moral. So, you know, you can pick up on that and, and, and be just fair and moral about your decisions. But I do want to also say that uh, there are a number of grassroots organizations out here that don't get any funding, but they are passionate about what they're doing and they are making uh good decisions and they are making a difference in the community because they're not funded because they don't have a 501c3 because you know they don't have a grant writer you know they miss out on the opportunities to uh, do everything that they would like to do with, with our kids with our families uh, within the community and I, I see time at the time certain people continuously are the ones that get the grants. And I, I I personally would love to see some of the grassroots organizations get some of that money and, and help them to thrive and to continue to uh, work with our children and families and mm -hmm. things of that nature. Because we, I mean, it, it, that two million, that, that two million is, is just a, a drop in the bucket. You know, we have so many problems with our educational system, you know, and, and the city itself is is traumatized, you know. It's just one thing after another, just over and over again. You know, our kids are traumatized, the moms, the families, you know, and our, our men, they need help just as well as our women because our men, they get so frustrated and what they do is is they lash out to the closest person around them and, and that's their friend, you know what I'm saying? And you wonder why things happen the way they happen. There are no jobs being created. You know, everything I talk about, I, I reference my own life. You know, uh, when Philando got his first job at the age of 13, it was on Selby and Avon. This man, I forget, you know, a lot because that was so long ago. He had a little shop on that corner in, uh, I don't know if he or his friends or whatever, you know, they used to go around collecting dis discarded bicycles. And they bring these bikes to this little building. So you got kids in there learning how to uh, repair bicycles. Mm hmm and little small engines, like little small air conditioners and lawn mowers and snow blowers. So they're learning a, a trade at the same time, you know, and it's keeping them off the streets. Yeah. You know, we need to create jobs where there are no jobs, you know. And uh, I, I just reference that a lot, but like him, you know, a little small organization that's really making an impact on uh, our communities. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the people that are very deserving of some of that money. So yeah. you can think about that instead of the same people getting that money and then they gonna talk. It's about production. We need to see something happening, you know, we got so many, so many people talking about the inclusion and mm -hmm. diversity training and this and that, and you know, I'm not seeing the community getting anything out of that. I mean, they may be understanding some different type of language or or understanding uh, how the police work a little bit different or whatever, but it's it's not helping economically. You know, our kids need uh, some type of trade. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, working on a bicycle, because who knows, that kid may grow up and open up a, a bicycle repair shop. Right. You know, or uh, become a, 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 an inventor and, and design something because you got some kind of knowledge about uh, a wheel and a piece of steel. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. 
there is something that can come out of that greater than just a conversation. Yeah. Do you, um, you know, a lot of people would want to see the $2 million go directly um, to efforts to combat community police relations or um, gun safety, and you didn't take me there um, with that, which is interesting. But I am getting pressure to say, you know, you need to put that $2 million right into community policing. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying, like, I mean, so I'm hearing, you Girl, know. Girl, uh, uh, I hope you're not talking about, well, I'm just going to say, I hope you're not considering the police at all because, you know, they get enough money and they still not following their own rules. So, you know, that's, that's, uh, throwing good money over bad because they're not following their own rules. But like I said, uh. Do you see this Talking. as good money? Do you see the two million as as money that can be used for good? Yeah, I think some good can come out of it, even though it came out of a bad situation. You know, I think uh, any money can be helpful if it's used in the right in the right areas. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, talking and talking is not gonna solve uh, any of the the real issues that we have in our communities. Mm-hmm. We got enough people out there talking, baby. Every time you look around this Facebook post with somebody talking, it's about uh about getting action. out there and uh what they call it, put your boots to the ground. Mm-hmm. It's about uh walking the walk now. Mm-hmm. Do you have any um advice you'd want to share with our listeners about um how they can uh, move into action, move away from talking and move to action? Uh, volunteering is always a big thing you know you can get yourself involved in uh, uh, volunteering at some of these great organizations or uh, I mean talking is good and you know we're at a pivoting point in 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 society as a whole and uh, I think talking and communicating with other people and just uh, understanding how other people feel is a great avenue. I mean, you can always, you know, with your church, just pick a day and, and get your church members together and have that conversation. You know, these are tough conversations about race and uh, 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 injustices and things like that because people are beginning to understand and see it when they didn't know, just like in Falcon Heights, you know, they swore, oh, we have the best police department in the world. Oh, our police could never do a thing like that until they start listening to these testifiers. You know, when they start talking about they live in Falcon Heights and they were holding meetings at their apartment and their friends of color got stopped every time they came over for the meeting. They had to move the meeting outside of Falcon Heights. That's because they didn't know that this was going on right in their communities. You know, it's things that, that may be happening in your community. You don't even know about it because it's not happening to you. You don't know because you don't see it. And you don't have anybody coming to you saying, hey, look, I'm not coming to your house no more. This is the seventh time I got stopped coming over here to to visit you. You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of things that the community can do as well and volunteering and, and holding uh, meetings and talking about different issues would also be uh, important to mm-hmm. engage with one another. Yeah. I have um, also not necessarily seen myself as a philanthropist, although I do give um, dollars into the community and now I'm working formally in philanthropy and we talked a little bit about the fund but I'm in a space now where I am making uh, decisions and, and have an opportunity have a platform and um, really want to know what advice you might have for me uh, my advice to you like I said when you're making your decisions just think about uh those mom and pop shops on the corner, the little small places that don't give, that don't get recognized the way they should. These are the people that, if you don't have money, you can go to this store on this corner and get your bread and your milk and your eggs without no money. Yeah. 
You understand what I'm saying? But you can't go to Cubs and walk out of there without paying for something. But it's just the small little people that are really making an impact in the community and actually helping. And, you know, they get overlooked so often because they don't have a, a grant writer or the mm -hmm. foundation behind the name of it or the 501c3 part of it because those applications they're difficult yeah they you are you know and they, they are. are sticklers if you don't word that joker the correct word is getting kicked out the door mm -hmm. so i i want you to uh just understand and know there are a lot of organizations out there that some of those guys are coming out of their pockets when they take these children to different places because I think that uh, if you uh, expose children to different things, it can broaden their minds and broaden uh, their their perception about life in general. You know, and and you got these uh, little grassroots organizations that that does that. They take the kids in. A, a different space and let them see something different about life and I think that uh, those places need help most mm -hmm. because you, you, you still got the Minneapolis Foundation, you still have the St. Paul Foundation and uh, the other big foundations that uh, generate money when you build the grant applications out but I think that that money should be used locally in our communities to the smaller organizations that are really, really trying to make a difference. Because them other folks, they know where to get that money from. Trust me when I tell you, they yeah. know how to get it. Yeah. I recently saw you at um, Mia with the Lonnie Bunch when he came to talk about uh, his work launching the Smithsonian, the African American Museum. I just had the pleasure of going there. Um, I, I heard you get up and talk there. That was a great day. Yeah, that yes, was a great it was. Day. Yes, it was. He's, he's such a pleasant, pleasant man. And to just hear his uh, struggle of how that manifested, you know what I'm saying? Here you are, you don't have a dime, but then you pull off this brilliant art museum, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And uh, I didn't meet him when I did go, but... Uh, we were able to skip the line to get in, <laughs> and we skipped the line to eat. You know, that, that food up in there is fantastic. It is fantastic. Hey, and girl. Oh, man, it's good. And, and him really just bringing it all the way full circle and saying, like, I mean, he had to come up with a way to show all of who America has been, yeah. right? All of the, the ugliness, the brutality of it, and at the same time try to find the hope of it. Yeah. And um, when you were talking about making sure to get to the mom and pop shops and when he shared that most of the stuff that he found in the museum were in people's garages and in their attics and in their yeah. basements. And it's yeah. like, you know, sometimes the beauty is not where it is beautiful. Yeah. Right. The good stuff happens and, and places that we often overlook. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you, you said that girl. Well, I was I feeling like it. That. I was feeling it. Yeah. <laughs> I was you feeling that. that. If someone wanted to provide any support to the Flandreau Castell Relief Foundation, how would they do that? Uh, the foundation has an account at Wells Fargo Bank. Uh, there is also a GoFundMe account, and as well as a PO box. That's PO box two two one one one, Robbinsdale, Minnesota five five four two two. Perfect. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, my dear. You're welcome. Love you. Please check out the Minneapolis Foundation website to find more episodes of this podcast, information on upcoming events, and for my book recommendations. Thank you to Weber Shadwick for their partnership and support in making this podcast come alive.